morning, everybody. Welcome back. CS125. So, today we're going to do a couple things. One of the first things we're going to do is talk about the midterm, go over one of the problems on the midterm. Um, one of the problems that surprised us, I'll just put it that way, surprised me in terms of how people approached it. Um, we're then going to do one last example on trees, and then we're going to move on to talking about sorting, which is a particular algorithm that's going to occupy us for the next couple of lectures. For a couple of reasons. One is that sorting is tremendously important, um, and I'll try to convince you of that today, uh, but also because sorting provides a really interesting chance for us to look at a number of different algorithms to solve the same problem. Look at trade-offs between them, look at some of their different properties. We're gonna see both iterative and recursive solutions to sorting. Um, so this is a fun, a fun space for us to kind of play in for the next couple weeks. Sorry, next couple lectures. We will not talk about sorting for a couple weeks. That would be too long. Okay, so let's look at the final programming problem from the, sec the second midterm, midterm one. Overall, people did quite well on this exam. I was happy about that. This problem, people found to be a challenge. And I just want to kind of try to explain myself, which is that when I wrote this problem, the goal was not to create a big programming challenge for you to solve. Um, when I saw how people were approaching this, I was honestly quite surprised. So I learned a little bit of something about how you guys think about problems from this. Um, I don't know what happened. Maybe you had a little bit of PTSD from the first midterm, and it was like the last programming problem, and you were like, I need to run a lot of code, and, and you just sort of like, a lot, a lot of you, including people who got credit for the problem, really kind of wandered off in this way too complicated direction. Um, so I wanna go through this together. So here is the problem description. This problem is now up on our public homework problem set, so you guys can review it there. Um, the idea was you're supposed to provide a class called min-max. There were three methods, and you know, there were people who complained, well, I don't know what add does. Well, sometimes you actually have to read the entire description of the class before a particular method will make sense. I know that up until this point, a lot of times we've provided you with the method description that's quite exhaustive, but in this case, in order to understand what add did, you actually had to read the description of min and max and then kind of loop back to it. So you have a function add that takes a reference to a Java comparable, and you could, I think in this case you could actually, there were a variety of return types for add that we would have accepted. Add didn't need to return anything. And then there's two other methods that this class provides. One of them is called min. Min is supposed to return a reference to the smallest object, the smallest Java comparable, which we have to take because we're gonna compare them together, so we need things that support some notion of order. So min takes no arguments, and it should return a reference to the Java comparable, the smallest Java comparable that's been added to the class using add. Max does the same thing, except it returns a reference to the largest Java comparable that's been added to the class. So what a lot of people did, and I'm not gonna pick on anybody by uh, showing one of these solutions, is for some reason, they decided to use an array to do this problem, okay? Um, it's an interesting solution and fundamentally wrong. Um, so let's look at the rest of the problem description. It's supposed to use compare to to compare objects. Okay, we're kind of used to that by now. Um, it's supposed to provide two constructors, an empty constructor and one that allows me to initialize the, the class with initial value. Um, and we also pointed out that um, we're always, once we create an instance of min-max, we're actually gonna pass the same type arguments to it every time. So you didn't have to worry about comparing two different Java objects that might have been of different types. Okay. So, you know, again, the, the, the solution, quote unquote, that I saw for this, and, and had, like I said, had we anticipated that people would have tried to solve the problem this way, uh, the test suites would have checked for this more carefully. Um, this was supposed to be, you know, like a, a the, the goal of this question was really to test whether you understand how to use compare to. It was not to test whether you could write loops over arrays and stuff like that. Um, but what it seemed like a lot of people decided to do was create an array, and then you have your first problem, which is how big should this array be? So sometimes when you're solving a problem like this, you know, 
I think a lot of you used arrays to solve this problem. I've seen a lot of solutions that did. And you could write a solution that used arrays that passed the test cases. It was really hard, though, because it forced you to write a lot of unnecessary code. But let me ask you a question. If you solve the problem that way, where in the problem description does it tell you how large that array should be? Yeah, Jim. Okay, so you could have used an array list too if you were clever. But, but if you, but again, like there's, there's this fundamental missing piece from this question if you're gonna try to approach it that way. How many values does it tell you that you're supposed to be able to accept? Does it say that? For those of you that actually used a fixed size Java array, I've seen people that put like 100. Is, does 100 appear in the problem description? Does it ever say, you will have to remember at max 100 numbers? So if you approach the problem this way, when you do things like this in the future, that's kind of a hint that maybe you're on the wrong track. You're forced to introduce a parameter into the problem that's not in the description. So again, if you use a fixed size array, you were saying they're being like, oh, how big should it be? I don't know. Does it say? No, maybe, maybe that means I'm on the wrong track. How many values does this class have to remember? Let me ask, a, let me put the question that way. We don't tell you how many times add is going to be called, but how many values does this class actually have to remember? Does it need to remember every value that's ever been added? How many do you, how many do you need to be able to return at most? Yeah. Two. One from min and the other from max. So at most, if I've added two, three, four elements, right, two, three, four values, at most, even if I add a million values to this class, it only has to remember references to two, the minimum and the maximum. So let's, let's go through the solution for this. Okay, so I've set up an example here just to, to kind of get myself started. It's gonna go through in a loop, add a bunch of numbers, and when I'm done, the min should return zero, so that's gonna be the first value, and the max should return 10. I should see that changing on every uh, step. So I'm gonna create my class min max. I'm gonna create two variables of type comparable to store my min and max. These are the only values this class has to be able to store. So remember. Let's create our constructors. So I'm supposed to take one empty constructor, and it turns out that constructor actually doesn't have to do anything. I take a second constructor that takes a comparable, and all I'm gonna do here is call to add. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna call add on that reference. Okay, let's finish the easy parts. I need a method called max, takes no arguments, returns a comparable. I'm gonna return my max. I need a method called min, takes no arguments and returns a comparable. I'm gonna return my min. So that's all of the easy stuff. I've got a way to remember the max. I'm storing a reference to it on the class. I've got a way to remember my min. I'm storing a reference to it on the class. I've got getters, essentially. We didn't ask you to call them get min, but these are essentially just getters, return references to the min and max. All I have to do now is write add. So what is my add function going to do? Based on this class setup, I have no array. So what do I need to do in add? What's the algorithm here? Yeah. Exactly. Bingo. So the answer was, I take my new so let's, let's write add. Add, this takes a comparable, I'm gonna call it to add. First thing I'm gonna do is compare with my min. I also have a special case to handle here because if there's no values that have been added, then I also wanna save this. If it's the first value, then it's both the min and max. So I say if min is null or min.compare to, to add, is less than zero, and I think that's right, we'll find out in a minute, then I store the min. This is my new minimum. So if I've never seen a value before, or 
is this value is smaller than my minimum. And hold on. Just positive value is first is larger than second. So a negative value first is smaller than second. So I think this is actually backwards. If my current min is larger than the new value, then it means the new value is small. All right, so there's how I handle my min. And I need to do something very similar for my maximum, except the conditions are different. That's it. That's the entire problem. Let's see if this works. Maybe I have something backwards in my conditions. Nope. Works perfectly. So on every loop through the array, what am I doing? I'm adding a new value. And then I'm printing off both the min and the max. The minimum gets set once, the first time the loop runs to zero, and then I'm adding some subsequently larger values, and so every time the loop executes, I get a new value. Let's try doing this, just to make sure this works in the other direction. I'll count down, same thing. So now my minimum is changing every time, because I'm using subsequently smaller values. Questions about this? Yeah, so, so, and, and again, I think there were, there were people, you know, once it is possible, given the test suites we provided, to solve this question using a large enough array. But if you try doing that, what you found is that you had to write a lot more code than this. It was like three or four times as long, and it was complicated. You had to go through, you essentially had to do a minimum search over the entire array to solve min, you had to do a minimum search over the entire, maximum search over the entire array to solve max. Um, and so, you know, this is, I think, for some of you, a great lesson in thinking about how to approach problems, right? Because, like I said on the forum, I mean, when, you know, in this class, and this is one of the weaknesses of this class that we are well aware of and have, have been brainstorming how to address in the future, you can get away with writing some pretty awful code to solve some of our problems. Whether they're recursion problems, whether they're this type of homework problem, whether it's the MP, you know, we, we are not yet, but we want to do this in the future, grading you on the quality of your code. It's hard to do that. Of course, this problem, it actually would have been fairly simple, because I could have said, if your solution is longer than 50 lines, I'm just not gonna give you credit, because you're clearly doing something wrong, right? Um, if you had to write a bunch of loops and stuff like that, then the solution quickly got out of hand. But, at some point, you know, and, and this is something to think about as you go along for the rest of the semester. At some point, you're gonna run into someone who is gonna look at your code. And that is going to matter, because your code's gonna be, you're gonna be at Google and your code's gonna be up on a whiteboard. Or, you know, you're gonna be doing an online interview for Facebook and your code is gonna be in a Google Doc. And the interviewer is gonna be looking at it. And if you write, you know, a god-awful solution to a problem, even if it works, that's gonna be a sign to them that you are not ready to program at the level that they expect at those type of places. Questions about this before we go on? So, so again, you know, at this point, the class isn't really set up to help you with this as much as we would like, although you are welcome to, once you finish the daily homework problems, particularly the next day, post your solution on the forum, and we'll talk about it, right? We can say, okay, I think you can clean this up a little bit. I think that there are some redundant, you know, conditional statements here and stuff like that, right? But, but this is something, and you'll get better at this over time. But it is something to strive for, right? Once you've solved a problem, look at it for a little bit and say, is there a way I can make this better, more beautiful, more intuitive? It's not always shorter, either. I don't, I don't want to, to, to um, fool you into thinking that what we're after here is just compactness. That's not it. There are a lot of places where it makes sense to write a longer version of a, of a, of a solution because it's more clear. But in this case, again, if you used an array, you were just following a fundamentally broken solution approach. Even if you used an array list, at some point, after I've added a million values to your class, it's gonna crash, because it's gonna run out of memory. Because you're doing something you don't need to do, you're storing all these values. Okay, great. Any other questions about our second midterm? I'll just throw the floor open to this. Uh, like I said, we put, you know, examples of the problems up on the, the homework problems that you guys look at, including this one. Right, so I would encourage you to, to, to do that if you have questions about it. Okay. So let's warm up today by 
doing another tree problem. Uh, we're gonna largely stop talking about recursion on trees today, but we may come back to it a couple times just to do some of these little fun problems to keep you thinking about it. We will definitely continue to have homework problems involving recursion on trees, at least for tomorrow and Friday, and maybe a little bit of next week as well. Okay, so here's a problem that is, was not chosen at random, might be related to some of the things you guys are doing on MP5. So my goal here is that I want to take a tree, and I want to convert that tree into a list. So a tree is this hierarchical data structure where every node can have, you know, uh, one parent, and in our case, when we're talking about binary trees, two children, and what I'm trying to do, sometimes we refer to this as flattening the tree. I want to take the tree, and instead of this, this tree-based structure, I want a list containing all of the values in the tree. I don't really care about the structure of the tree at that point. I might be trying to do something where I just try to enumerate all the values that are in the tree. So how are we gonna, how are we going to do this? What is, so, you know, whenever we design recursive algorithms together, we look at three things. We look at what is our base case? How do we handle that? So what's the base case here? This is not that different from the other problems we've looked at. Recursive tree traversal. I'm trying to find every node in the tree, and I'm gonna put it in a list. But fundamentally, to do that, I have to visit every node in the tree. So one of the things you should start to recognize are tree recursion problems where visiting every node is required. This is one of the problems where visiting every node is required. So how do I visit every node in a tree or a binary tree, typically? What are my recursive steps? What's my base case? Yeah. I've either hit a leaf node, or in this case, I'm gonna say I've actually walked off the end of a leaf node. I'll stop at that point. It just makes my recursion a little bit cleaner. So if I've reached a null node, it means there's no tree below me. So there's nothing to do. I, there are no more nodes to find. So I can stop. Recursive step is I'm gonna, as usual, break the tree into two parts. I'm gonna say, I'm going to, in order to find all the nodes in the tree, I'm gonna first find all the nodes in my right subtree, and then I'm gonna find all the nodes in my left subtree, and I'm gonna find a way to combine results from those two operations. So I'm gonna recurse into the right subtree and the left subtree separately. And here's where things get a little bit different for this particular problem, which is, how am I gonna combine results? And here what I'm gonna show you is, is, is an example. So in some of our examples in the past, the way that we've combined results is we've looked at the return value from our recursive call. So when I was counting, I would say, my right recursion is gonna return a result, and my left recursion is gonna return a result, and I'm gonna figure out if I'm part of the count, and then I'll add those three things together. In this style of recursion, what I'm doing is I'm actually gonna pass a data structure, in this case, a reference to a list, to all of the recursive steps. And the way that they're gonna combine results is by adding themselves to the list. So every call to the recursive function is gonna receive a reference to the same list, and it's gonna say, I'm gonna add myself to it, and then I'm going to restart the recursion on my right child and my left child. So a brief digression into something that you're already familiar with, but something that you will need to start using. This is one of, you know, what I've referred to as the two data structures you meet in heaven. This is a Java list. So we've talked about lists in class, and you have implemented um, several versions of our simple list interface. But, you know, now we can throw the doors open and we can actually let you use real Java lists. So Java provides a list interface. This has methods similar to the ones that we included in our simple list interface, but it also has some other really useful features. We're gonna look at it together in a second. Java also provides several, and these are not the only ones, different implementations, classes that implement the list interface. And so here's an example of initializing two lists. Notice that I'm casting them to list references, and there's a reason I'm doing this. I'll show you in a sec. So on line five, I'm creating a list called list, and I'm initializing it to a new array list. As the implementation of name of this class suggests, this is a list that's implemented that uses an array internally to store data. Other than that, you can use it like a list. This is the power of interfaces. I can essentially use this list like any other Java list. I don't have to care how it's implemented, but when I instantiate it, I know how it's implemented. I'm making a choice here. I'm saying, in this case, I wanted a list that's backed by an array. 
On line six, I've created another list, so I have another reference to a list called another list, and in this case, I've chosen to make this a uh, linked list class. So Java also provides a list implemented using a linked list internally. Both of these are similar, but not identical to the ver variations of this that we've talked about in class. But they are real, they're provided by the Java standard library, you don't need to implement them yourselves, you can just use them now and go on happily with your life. Because they are pretty fantastic. So here's the official Java list interface, and there's bits of this that are not gonna make sense to you yet, but we are gonna come back and talk about some of this on Friday. So for now, just imagine that this list stores objects. So wherever you see E here, just replace it with object. And what can I do? I can add things to the list. Um, I can either provide an index, or I have a version of add that just puts things at the end. Um, I can add a bunch of things to the list, so I can, if I have one list, I can add all of the elements to another list. I have a method called contains that's quite useful. That returns true if an object that's equal to the object I pass is already in the list. So this is quite useful. This essentially allows me to use lists for membership testing. Um, and I've got get, right, so it returns the value to, at, at a list. I can return the index of an object in the list, so the first index, because the object can appear multiple times, so this finds the first index. And there's a variety of other helper methods here that you can look at. Um, you know, we're gonna focus on using a couple uh, of them. I have no idea what this of is for. Um, I can remove things from the list, but fundamentally this supports the operations we talked about on our simple list. Get and set at a particular index, add and remove from anywhere in the list. So let's see how to, let's just play with these for a minute before we get started with our recursive example. So I'm gonna create two lists here, and then I'm gonna add something to the list. And the nice thing about Java array lists is that they have a nice print method built in. So I've added a value zero, now I'm gonna print the list, I see that the list contains value zero, okay, that makes sense. Let's try list.add, um, let's add to index one, so I'm gonna put this at the back of the list, so that's where it ends up. Let's do another add to index one, put a two in there. Wait, hold on, I have to do my usual example. Um, there you go. I can remove things from it. Again, this is, this is, you guys should be pretty familiar with this. You've implemented some of these functions. So you have a, a, a pretty good understanding of what they do. But we've got some new features that are kinda cool. So list.contains, let's see if it contains two at this point. That's true. Does it contain five? That's false. So why, so we, when you're using Java lists, I just wanna point this out in terms of the power of interfaces. So this will also work. I don't have to cast my array list to a list interface type. I can just use it as a reference to an array list. And everything will work. But here's what's cool about casting it to a list interface. So let's say that you have some code that's using this list, and at some point you realize, you know what? This code is actually really important. It's running a lot. It's slowing my whole program down, and it would be nicer if I implemented this using a linked list, because the pattern of operations that I'm performing is gonna be more efficient on a linked list. So if you use an interface type, that's all you have to do. Do you see that? I just fundamentally changed the behavior of my list by modifying one line. Because once I have a list once I have a reference to a list interface, I can use it like any other list. If I have a reference to an array list here, then I can't use it like any other list. Because it's, it's, a, it's an array list. But if I cast it to a reference type, then I can put anything on the right side that implements the list interface. You might also get to a point where maybe your, this part of your program is so specialized and you understand how you use the list so well that you implement your own version of a list that implements a list interface and you can put that on the right side. Okay, questions about lists before we go on? This is something that we're gonna expect you guys to start using. All right, so let's do this um, recursive all values. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. Actually, this is gonna be void. So as I've done in many 
which it should be private. So I've, I've done, in many of my recursive examples, I'm going to let my public method be a wrapper function that calls a private method that does the actual work so that I can start that private method on the root node and it can recurse properly. But there's a difference here, which is that I'm not only passing the root to this private method, I'm also passing a reference to a list. And that list contains all the values in the tree that I've seen so far. And so in my wrapper method, I need to not only start the recursion, but I need to create this list. So here's how I create a new empty list. I'm gonna do that in my wrapper function. Then I'm gonna start the recursion on the root node with my list of values, and then I'm gonna return that list when I'm done. You can also write this so that the wrapper, the inner, the private method also returns a reference to a list, but you can do it this way as well. I think that for this example, uh, my goal here is to kind of help you understand the fact that by passing this reference around, I now have any call to the recursive function has the ability to change the list. All right, so what's my base case here? How do I know when to stop? Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna set this up so that if I get to current it's null, I'm done. Don't continue recursing. And I'm not at a valid node, so I shouldn't add this value to the list. All right, so otherwise, what do I do? Otherwise, it means I've arrived at a node, and so I wanna add that node's value to the list. So I'm gonna do values.add current.value. That's it. So this is how I'm combining results, and then I need to do my recursive calls. So I'm gonna call all values on, sorry, this should be all values, not all value. On my right child, I'm gonna call all values on my left child. So once I walk off the bottom of the tree, I'm done. Otherwise, I'm gonna add myself to the list and then restart the recursion on either subtree. Yes? Ah, yes, good point. Thank you. So I also need to pass to the recursive step a reference to the list, right? Okay, let's see if this works. Good, it does. So I'm printing off the result of all values, and let's see how this is working. So let's print at each step my list, and you'll see that it starts off empty, and then I get to the first node, and then I get to the second node, and why are there two more copies of the list printed there? So I started at the root, and I moved down to its, one of its children, which is node two, and then I print the same list again twice. Why is that happening? Yeah. It texted two children, and those children are null. So in this, tr in this tree that I've created, clearly node two has no children. So I go to node two's right child, it's null, I don't add anything to it. I go to node two's left child, it's null, I don't add anything to it. Now I'm backing up and I start going down node three, and now I'm going to both of node three's children, one is node four, and so when I get to node four, I add it to the list, and then node four has two null children, and node three has one null child. It has four is one child, and then null is the other. So when I'm done, I have a list of all the nodes questions about this? This is new, yeah. Do I have to do right before left? Nope, so the question is do I have to do right before left? No, it doesn't matter. I can do them in either order. Oop. Now this will affect the order in which I visit nodes in the tree. So if I do left before right, it means that I'm gonna recurse down all of the left subtrees first, and then I'm gonna do the right subtrees. So it will affect the order in which the nodes are in the list. But I never said that the nodes in the list had to be there in any particular order, so it's fine. As long as they're all in the list, I'm happy. Uh, great question. Other questions about this? So again, another type of recursion where I'm passing a shared data, essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating a shared data structure of this list, and then I'm passing it to each step in the recursion. And the recursion can either modify it 
or leave it unmodified. Um, and in this case, I'm modifying it to add myself because I'm the, you know, this is the first time I've reached this node. Okay, good. So, let's back up and talk again about how general a set of problem solving techniques these are. The, the recursion techniques that are that we're developing. So, we pointed out that every tree is itself, every subtree of a tree is a tree. Last time we looked at lists and how to do recursion on lists. Every, if I take, tear a list into two pieces, two contiguous pieces, each one of those pieces is a list. This is also true for arrays, and we're gonna start using that feature of arrays when we talk about sorting, because we're gonna talk about several recursive sorting algorithms that sort an array by breaking it into smaller and smaller subarrays. I wanna do, I wanna encourage you to do one thing for me, if you do nothing else, which is that don't just reach for recursion on lists, sort of reflexively. I know some of you love recursion and you think you're really clever because you can implement recursive algorithms. I think you're really clever too. I'll think you are more clever if you figure out when to use recursion and when not to use recursion. On trees, it is very common to use recursion. And you might start thinking about why that is. I'll talk about that more if you want, but it's hard to visit every element in a tree in order because every node can have two children. In a list, it's extremely easy to loop over a list. You can write this little for loop that just goes through every element in a list. And so, it's not as, you know, I tend to think that solutions to list problems are easier to understand when they're done using a loop. So here's another version of reverse that I'm not gonna talk about at length, but you guys can look at it on the slides, that goes through the list item by item and essentially reverses it by flipping the references around. And it does this iteratively rather than recursively. There is no recursive step in this function. Instead, I'm using a loop. I can actually, I can actually write this a little bit more, a little bit cleaner. Fundamentally, you know, I guess this is up to you. The recursive version of reverse that we wrote in class was shorter, right? Maybe some of you think it was more elegant. Maybe some of you are still trying to figure out how it works, right? Um, sometimes by writing something iteratively using a loop, it's a lot more clear, right? I think this is, I, I tend to think this is true with lists, right? So don't automatically use recursion on lists. It's not always a great choice. You can loop through a list fairly easily. Okay, well let's talk about array recursion, because this is something that we need to understand now that we're gonna talk about sort. So, every contiguous subarray of an array is itself an array. So if I tear this array into smaller pieces, you can almost think of this as like a tree as I'm descending, right? I started off by looking at the entire array here, and then I said, okay, I'm just gonna look at the left subarray, and I could, these could be either size, but I'm doing them even just to keep things nice. And then, okay, well, I've still got, I can still make the problem smaller, how do I make it smaller? I only look at the left half of this array, how do I make the problem smaller? I only look at the left half of this array. And at this point, I can't make the problem any smaller. I've reached an array that has a single element. But I can continue this process down the entire array. And again, in, in some ways, this has a nice mapping with what we've done on trees. So how do I make a tree recursion problem smaller? I break it into the right subtree and the left subtree. How do I make an array recursion problem smaller? I divide the array somehow. A lot of times when I'm doing array recursion, I want to divide it as evenly as possible. So I want to take an array, and I want to look at the first half of the values and the second half of the values. If the array has an odd size, I can't do that exactly, so I may not be perfect, but usually a lot of times when we're working with arrays, that's what we want to do. Okay, great. So with array recursion, just to emphasize this point, what are our, how do we make the problem smaller? We break the list, break the array, sorry, into two smaller arrays. Again, typically, in order to get good performance for our recursive algorithms, we want those arrays to be roughly the same size. We'll talk about why that is in a little bit. The smallest subproblem is an array with a single element. At that point, if I can't solve the puzzle, I'm in trouble. I've made the problem as small as I can, um, and, and, and so how do we combine results depends on the problem that is resolved. Okay. 
So like I said at the beginning of class, what we're gonna talk about for the next several lectures are sorting algorithms. And there are, this is a fun, I hope, part of the class, because this is a class of algorithms that are classic, incredibly interesting, but still also very, very relevant, okay? They also bring together some of the things we've been talking about. So we're gonna look at how to implement sorting algorithms imperatively. We're gonna look at how to analyze their performance using our big O notation. We're also gonna look at recursive sorting algorithms. So we'll look at some that are iterative, some that are recursive. Um, so the reason that sorting is so important, it, it feels simple. It's sort of like comparable in the sense that it's so powerful and yet it seems so subtle. But by maintaining certain data structures in a sorted form, there's a variety of different algorithms that just start to work a lot better. And so sorting itself is used frequently as a building block for other algorithms. There's a lot of other algorithms that assume that the data that they start with is sorted, and then they use that in order to improve their own performance. If I sort a tree in a particular way, I can find elements in it much more effectively. If I sort an array, I can find values in it much more quickly. Um, I just said these things. Um, you know, and, you know, sorting can also be used to present data in a particular way. A lot of times when we look at, you know, particular data sets, we wanna sort them in certain ways so that we can make uh, sense of them more easily. So this is still a new problem. Um, there is a uh, competition, this is still going on. You can see that the, uh, there was a round held in 2018. Um, this is, I can't remember exactly what this is called now. I always call it the Jim Gray sort challenge. So there is a still ongoing interest in this problem. So what I'm showing you here are results from this worldwide competition that's held every year. And the only goal in this competition is to sort stuff. Huge amounts of stuff. Either fast, cheap, efficiently, the, the metrics vary. So there's a variety of different types of competition, uh, types of, you know, uh, different entries in this competition. Uh, there's explanations here on what these mean. So some of these are for sorting huge data sets really fast, regardless of the cost. Some of them are for sorting huge data sets efficiently in terms of money, in terms of, you know, computer cycles, computer power, in terms of energy. Um, but this is an ongoing challenge. I'm trying to see who the current winners are. Um, so it looks like, I wish they had the dates on here. Yeah. But, but this is, these, these are not old results. Probably a lot of these were achieved in the last five years. This is an ongoing research problem and an ongoing implementation problem. And the reason why it's so interesting to so many people is this matters so much. You know, if you could, if you could come up with a way to make sorting twice as fast, and you can't do that because people have been working on this problem for, you know, a hundred thousands of years. But if you could do that, it would dramatically improve the performance of all sorts of different parts of our computer ecosystem. All sorts of different computer systems would get faster. Google would get faster. Facebook would get Like, everything you use would get faster, instantly, because you made sorting faster. So people still care about this stuff. This is also a moment to just mention uh, one of the pioneers, another Turing Award winner, um, someone named Jim Gray. So the sort challenge is named after Jim Gray. Um, he was a pioneer in the field of database uh, systems and data, data processing. And you know, this is a really sad story that you should know about him. He's an extremely well-respected member of the computer systems community. There's a story, which I'm not sure if it's entirely fictional or not, about at some point Microsoft wanted to hire him uh, to work at their research lab. There was only one problem. Microsoft was located in Seattle, and Jim Gray was located in San Francisco, in the Bay Area. And Jim Gray said, I'm not leaving. So what did Microsoft do? They opened up a research lab in the Bay Area so they could hire Jim Gray. Um, sadly, he vanished at sea in 2007, and there was this really, um, you know, again, ultimately futile and very sad, but also kind of very beautiful effort by the systems community to find him using all this crowdsourced data. They had all these people all over the world that were looking through maps to see if they could find uh, where his boat vanished to, but he was, he was never found. So he, would, he loved to sail. 
He was an avid sailor. He went out to sea one day in the San Francisco Bay and never came back. So anyway, but he left behind a really incredible legacy of wonderful work in this area. Okay. So we're gonna talk about a bunch of sorting algorithms. We are not gonna talk about every sorting algorithm, because there are too many. If you go to the Wikipedia page, you'll find dozens. There's like now a sorting algorithm that looks on Stack Overflow for implementations of sorting algorithms and runs them, right? That's a real thing. Uh, we're not gonna talk about that one. Um, I have no idea what its performance is. So maybe today, if we have time, we're gonna get to a, a, our first sorting algorithm. It's called insertion sort. This is imperatively um, implemented, has fairly bad performance. You guys are starting to see some of the other ones in lab. So lab, you look at selection sort. Um, we'll talk about merge sort on Friday. Um, and then uh, heap sort is another interesting implementation that we don't talk about. Um, quick sort we'll talk about in lecture as well. Both merge sort and quick sort lend themselves to recursive implementation, so it's another chance for us to get some practice with recursion on arrays. And there's a really interesting performance trade-off between the two of them. Merge sort, on one hand, is very stable performance, very good performance. Quick sort has good performance in the best case, and then very, very bad performance in certain cases. And so this gives us a chance to talk not just about big O, but about best case and worst case behavior when analyzing algorithms, which is always really important to understand. Bubble sort you guys will do in lab. This is kind of like the worst possible sort ever. Um, Except for uh, BOGO sort, which apparently is throwing things up in the air, basically just shuffle the values and see if they're sorted. If they're not, shuffle them again. Sometimes also called monkey sort. Um, to try to impress on you that this is still an open problem, I want to point out that the common sorting algorithm used by Python, used internally now by Java and a bunch of other programming languages, is actually something called Tim sort. So Tim is not some step in the Tim sort algorithm. Tim is the person who invented the Tim sort algorithm. So this is a sorting algorithm named after Tim. If your name is Jessica, maybe one day there'll be Jessica sort. You invent it, you can name it after yourself, apparently. Um, so Tim sort is a new implementation of a sorting algorithm. It's not fundamentally different than the other ones, but it's optimized for certain common cases. And again, this is now the default implementation in several widely used programming languages. So we are still working on this problem. We are still finding ways to do it better. Okay, so let's establish some ground rules for talking about sorting. We're usually gonna talk sorti about sorting on arrays, but you can sort lists, you can sort array lists, you can sort any sequential data structure. Um, we're gonna sort in descending order, who cares, right? You can sort in descending order, you can sort by, based on a variety of different criteria. Just to make things simpler, we're gonna usually focus on sorting things from smallest to largest. What that means, you know, a lot of times we'll talk about integers, but because we've talked about interfaces in this class this semester, we will start on Friday to generalize our sort a little bit and talk about how we can do it using any Java comparable. This is another fan fabulous example of how to use interfaces and how powerful they are. If I have something that's comparable, I can sort it. But today we'll just look at sorting integers, and a lot of the visual examples that I'll show you will use integers, they're just convenient. So when we talk about how to analyze sorting algorithms, we, when we do algorithm analysis on top of them, we're gonna be looking at a couple of different things. First thing is time complexity. We do care about that. Um, but sorting algorithms frequently have to run on large amounts of data. And so we also will pause at various points and think about the space complexity of the sorting algorithms that we talk about. If a sorting algorithm runs really fast, but requires lots and lots and lots of memory, then it may be okay for certain size data sets, but if you go to Google and say, hey, I think you should sort your index of, you know, trillions of web documents using this algorithm, they may say, maybe not. We, we just can't do it, right? We don't have enough memory on our machines. Okay. So, I think at this point I have enough time to present insertion sort, and then we will come back and implement it together on Friday. So our first sorting algorithm, how does it work, insertion sort? So the idea here is that I divide the array into two parts. I have an unsorted part and a sorted part. When the algorithm starts, the unsorted part is the entire array. And at each step, what I'm trying to do is make the sorted part bigger. 
Actually, when the algorithm starts, technically the sorted part, you can consider to be the first element, but whatever. So at every step in the algorithm, my goal is move something from the unsorted part of the array to the sorted part of the array. So how do I do that? This is an implementation detail. You can imagine the sorted part being at the end or at the beginning, it doesn't matter. But usually what I do is I start my sorted section at one end of the array, and I go through the array item by item, and I'm gonna move, every time I reach an item, I'm gonna move it into the sorted part of the array. So here's the first step. First step is very easy. The first item is sorted by construction, so I'm done. Now I'm gonna take five and move it into the sorted part of the array. Now I'm gonna take the next value, seven, and move it into the sorted part of the array. And if I continue this process, moving items one at a time from the red unsorted section to the blue sorted section, eventually I have sorted the entire array. So every step of insertion sort takes the unsorted part of the array and makes it one item smaller by moving it into the sorted part of the array. To keep the sorted part of the array sorted, I have to put it in the right spot. So that's why this is called insertion sort. I need to insert it into the right position in the array. So with eight, I'm not concerned. It's in the right spot already, it's the first element. When I get to five, I have to move five into the front of the array because it's smaller than eight. Now I'm looking at seven. Seven needs to be inserted between five and eight. Now I'm looking at three. Three is now inserted at the front of the list. Now I'm looking at four. Four is inserted here. In general, the new element can be, may be inserted at any point in the list. Sometimes it's in the right spot already. If it's the largest element, it stays put. So example for, for 11, 11 is the largest element in the array, so I don't have to do anything to it, just leave it alone. Six, on the other hand, needs to slot in between five and seven, and in certain cases, an element has to go all the way to the beginning. So now I've got negative one, which belongs at the beginning of the array, and so now I'm done. Okay, so let's look at a single step of this in more detail. We'll come back, we'll review this on Friday, and then we'll implement it together as our first example of a sorting algorithm, then we'll talk about its performance. So at this point, I've sorted most of the array, and I'm looking at item six. And so what I'm looking at is where should six go? And the way that I do this is I compare it one at a time. I start, I can, I can start at either end of the array, either at the front or at the back. And let's say that I'm starting at the back of the sorted part of the array. So I compare six with 11. I say, is six smaller than 11? If it is, I need to move 11 forward, and I need to keep looking. So now I look at six and eight. Is six smaller than eight? It is. So I move eight to the right, I keep going. Look at six and seven, is six smaller than seven? It is. So I move seven to the right and keep going. And now, I'm done. Because I look at six and five, is six smaller than five? No. And so this is the right spot for six. I have found a place in the list where the item to my left is smaller and the item to my right is greater, smaller than or equal to or greater than or equal to, depending on how I implement it, and I can stop. Now six is in the correct spot. Okay, so we will pick up here on Friday and implement this together. Uh, just have a couple of announcements. So the early deadline for MP5 is Monday. The threshold for the early deadline does require you to complete one of the non-trivial parts of MP5. So please don't start this at the last minute. It's a fun MP, we're getting a lot of good feedback about it. It is not necessarily an easy MP. And again, to get to 40, you have to do something a little more complicated than just find all the nodes. I have my office hours today at usual um, in my office in Siebel. I will see you all on Friday.